Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on this amazing episode of Tech Hub, your one-stop platform for all things tech in Africa. You know what I say, Tech Hub is for a smarter you. Today promises to be absolutely interesting. We're going to be having two very interesting conversations. One is with the foremost tech entrepreneur in not just his country, which is Ghana, but also in Africa, and also a conversation with, you know, players in the startup ecosystem from founders, venture capitalists, um, accelerators, um, VCs, and a whole lot of them. It was a strictly um, by invitation event that happened in Lagos at some time in the week. But you know what we do here at Tech Up? We give you a sneak peek of the discussion that happened there. Well, before we go into all that we have for today, um, Tech Up, you can be a part of the conversation, yes, um, by uh, across all social media platforms by using the hashtag Tech Hub. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we are right there at SilverbirdN24. If you use the hashtag Tech Up, we'll be able to track your conversation. Before we go into the nitty gritty of what we have today, let's go on a short break. And when we come back, Tech Up will be here to dish you more. How much of technology do you understand? I took a look at my LinkedIn and they said, they didn't see, I can't forget the words, hmm. evidence of your work. A Tech Hub will help you understand how tech can impact your life. Your phone and your SIM card is going to be a bigger asset. And with the power that we have with social media, with uh, the digital space right now, you can be anything you want to be. One of the other things we would see is that people would have more faith in tech companies and how much you can through tech impact your community the people who watch my videos the people who see me and see what i represent those are the people that i'm online tech hub is your one-stop platform for all things technology in africa tech hub for a smarter you it's the conversation right now that i'll be bringing to you is one i had with uh dr prince kofi kluchison a Ghanaian and one of the foremost Turk entrepreneurs in the continent who actually has the vision of ensuring that every university student across the continent has access to an internet-enabled device like a, a laptop or a tab. And he also um, is, is putting plans in place to ensure that every home has access to Wi-Fi. Imagine the possibilities that would come up when that happens. Mm. He has so much to say about how Tech in Africa is while there is seemingly there is a seemingly delay in the progress of uh, homegrown infrastructure and so many other issues bedeviling the continent um, that a solution to is as simple as A B C. You want to know what a solution is? This is the conversation I had with Dr. Prince Kofi Kluchison. <music> My whole life started many years ago when I came from the U.S. Uh, with uh, uh, my famous story, I would say 12 pocket calculators, <laughs> you know, where I began uh, my journey many years ago. And uh, one thing led to the other, to a um, uh, typewriter, you know, to calculators and to copiers in an office equipment business. And then eventually the emergence of the 90s, uh, you know, where one thing led to the other. I became the pioneer, <coughs> but actually introduced uh, telecoms one way or the other to Africa uh, with my relationship with AT&T uh, in Nigeria, Ghana, almost everywhere in Africa. Uh, but at that time, <coughs> it was, you know, the U.S. government or U.S. companies uh, does not have anything to Africa or there are policies in the U.S. under the Federal Communication Commission. Uh, you need to have an African strategy, which they did not have. Uh, so I had the opportunity to engage, you know, them. Uh, it all happened when one of my customers at that time wanted to know how they can use uh, data, you know, uh, you know, to uh, Unilever, USC at the time, uh, to be able to do their lab work. So, so you know, so I started finding around and it landed me to AT&T uh, in a very cold winter, you know, you know, in the 90s. And uh, one of the major things that, I, that happened to me that day when I arrived in New Jersey was uh, it's a lot of snow, about 12 inches worth of snow. Uh, I was a young man at that time, you know, and I was met at the airport. And uh, the, my guy that met me told me that, well, I'm sorry, this meeting is not going to last for 15 minutes. This guy didn't have time for Africa, <laughs> you know, so 
uh, just prepare yourself that the meeting, but they, they would like to talk to you, you know, because you'll be insisting. So when I got to the company, uh, the, they opened the conference room. When I got the whole conference room was full and I got scared. <laughs> I was very worried, you know. So then I gave an excuse, can I use the washroom? <laughs> So I got to the washroom when I got myself to the African palace. I prayed, <laughs> you know, the God, I'm here today, you know, send me to do whatever, you know. One of the major disclosures after me, I'm not a tech person, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a business person, marketing. Uh, tech has to be my passion or my blessing. So bear in mind that the meeting will last for 15 minutes, you know, at AT&T, Bell Labs, you know, yes. Uh, when I go to the room, they started throwing questions at me, engineers and so on. So I said, oh, you guys, wait, wait, wait. I'm from Africa. I'm from the royal family. Uh, in Africa, before we speak, we need to introduce ourselves. So can I know who you are? I guess I've prepared your elevator I've prepared speech. myself. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I finish that, I save half an hour. So I said, so we were down, relax. <laughs> so I passed the 15 minutes. So we got talking. And one thing led to the other. They became more interested in the kind of stories I'm saying. So by the time I finished that meeting, you know, that day, uh, there was an Indian guy called Mukesh uh, who said, wow, this guy impresses me. And they reminded him, himself as to when he came to the U.S., you know, as a young boy, you know, now he was the head of the, the team that was, you know, talking to me. So one thing led to the other, they said uh, uh, they are interested to continue, but then there must be so many corporate approval, FCC approvals, or whatever it is. You know, and also government handshake from Ghana, you know. So those times, it was a military government as well in Ghana, so nobody was interested in this. In guy. fact, I was going to even ask you back then in the <laughs> 90s, people was, were not even thinking about taking was, Africa. Was what was it like for you? I mean, how were you able to convince them? I mean, was it frustrating? It was not easy. Uh, my life story is all over the place when you go, you see a whole lot of them from Journey to Revelation. But it's a very interesting life that I've had for many, many uh, one of the major blessings I have is the word politics. You know, uh, uh, somewhere under the line, it does not influence me, it's not interested to me in terms of championing my life, my business history, or successful politics, but through my talents, my blessings, and what have you. Uh, sometimes it has conflicts, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it closes close you up. You know, but each time it closes up, there's a new beginning, you know, that begins, you know. Ninety-nine percent of the issue today in Africa has nothing to do with data infrastructure but connectivity. <laughs> you know, connectivity is the key, you know, to today. And you know. how would you reach connectivity in Africa? Yes, so therefore... Uh, if you look at the data today, we talk about African continental trade. If you look at the agreement, about 60% of the requirement is all about digital. Mm. You know, how to connect to here to Nigeria, to Kenya, or mm. whatever. Uh, people think of logistics or whatever. Even if you logistics, you need to track, you know, the goods to arrive there. So the first basic thing, if you look at the U.S., everywhere in the world, is start with putting connectivity at home, Wi-Fi at home. You know, for children from the basic school to have a tablet, to our Wi-Fi, you know, smart TV in our homes, you know, which are all the apps, you know, the first major thing which you call the smart homes. Now, you move on to other connectivity and all the gadgets that are homes. It's the first thing. If you can achieve that, uh, to make sure that almost, if you look at Ghana students in Nigeria, university students, common laptops they do not have even to connect, <laughs> you know. So those are the issues that are major. If you look at the world of tech business today, it's only devices. Africa for the last in the 90s has so far focused purely on cellular technology. They've not moved to IoT. <laughs> now, another major problem that is facing Africa today, the majority of the companies are moving to FinTech rather. Mm. <laughs> you know, FinTech other than the data, you know, the, uh, you know, the solutions, you know, no business. Majority of the focus has moved to FinTech, you know, which is very alarming. Now, the FinTech also, uh, uh, about three, four years ago, I did a major speech in Harvard, you know, on the on the on the issue of Safaricom, and I disagree, you know, with uh, uh, the 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 mobile money, you know, concept. My reason was that it was a big debate, you know. Eventually, I succeeded, 
because they couldn't understand why I'm challenging, you know, uh, you know, mobile money in business. I said, well, my agreement is that mobile money will not transform Africa to the digital economy. But it's solving the problem, and it's bringing about digital inclusion. That is a problem. So. It's not bringing digital, it's bringing analog inclusion, you know, because mobile money is not digital. That's one of the major problems <laughs> about mobile money. It's not digital, it's analog. Okay, you know, the, the, it's a mindset problem, you know. You see, there are two issues, you know, facing Africa today. One is what I call the old economy. The old economy is where all the government sits till today. Nigerian government, oil, and, you know, whatever, you know, the Delta region, the wars, or whatever. Ghana, GMPC. See, one of the major problems in Africa today is legal system, is the parliament system. Africans are not able to negotiate to hold equity, in, enough equity in all this investment in our countries. You know, where, you know, like Ghana, for instance, you know, where the petroleum that has about 11% equity. So in the data center business, unfortunately, in the data center business, it's not that difficult to do in terms of, uh, you know, providing the infrastructure. Even today, you don't need infrastructure. You need cloud systems for it to work. So putting things on the ground, it's not really, we've been getting uh, post-COVID, mm. things are changing again to cloud. We play a lot of with names, data capture, this and that, data mining and all of them and all of that. We've not reached that yet. Let's do the basic ones, you know, so that in the, the hospitals, look, if you go to one of the major provinces in Northern Africa, is that, you know, somebody is sick, a big man is sick, they brought it there, and then the, the, the person who will be there is living somewhere, he doesn't have a Wi-Fi, he doesn't have a phone to call <laughs> to be able to begin the journey. So the focus must be on the young people uh, who are not sophisticated, but who are aggressive, who want to learn. The whole world, look at China. China 30, 40 years ago, there were no bodies. All the politics, look at China. When you go to China today, the politics is only in Beijing. But when you leave Beijing, you go to the, the, the communities, that's where the action of Guangzhou, Guangzhou, whatever it is. So Africa, basically, the African continent is the key thing we all need to learn from and then hang on to it. And also, it does not bring the ECOWAS and African Union, you know, you just have a smartphone, a tablet, you can do whatever you want to do, but once you have a connectivity. So the connectivity, I think, is what we need to do again at the first thing. Uh, there are over a billion people in Africa. If you can connect all of us, you know, I think we'll be getting there. One of the other things we would see is that people would have more faith in tech companies. Tech Hub, for a smarter you. What are the challenges that have been facing startups, not just in Nigeria, but in the continent? I mean, just a few weeks ago, yes, um, of course, we did have the Nigeria Startup Act, and a lot of you know, founders were absolutely happy that, whoa, yeah, the Nigerian government is going to try as much as possible to ensure that the business environment is friendly enough for startups to thrive. Uh, pretty interesting and good. What about the rest of the continent? And what is the belief and the firm confidence that the policies that we put in place will be followed through to ensure that, you know, the ease of doing business happens in Nigeria? Good question, right? That is one of the conversation that, um, you know, people within the ecosystem came together to discuss in Lagos. You know, just a few days ago, it was an interesting conversation um, from issues around um, whether capital is available or not within the continent to issues around partnerships to the legal perspective and a whole lot of robust conversation about the issue was what uh, was discussed there. And we began the conversation with Alaba, who is the founder of uh, Business Africa Online. He spoke to us about the essence of the event. And from there, you hear from the panelists, uh, you know, who spoke about the theme of the event, which is uh, alliance and collaboration as a catalyst, you know, for growth of startups in the continent. You should listen to this. So we discovered that startups had uh, some challenges and aside funding, uh, networking was an issue for them, like um, building partnerships and collaborations too was an issue. So we decided to come up with, with this kind of platform whereby we can bring all the ecosystem players from startup CEOs to investors to venture studio operators to just come network and see how they, they could work together and build better. So our goal is to see more um, 
ecosystem players or startup CEOs work together as partners, as collaborators, and even to build better and stronger. I think we, you know, networks are so important, right? Um, they're both important for building partnerships. They're important for learning, just understanding how to build a business. And of course, they're important for seeking funding, right? So a lot of companies, uh, that first funding round you say is from friends, family, and fools, right? <laughs> so it's just the people you know, right? Or, or if you're going to seek institutional funding from some, you know, great, uh, VCs like the ones here who do early stage you you have to know who they are and where they are and connect and I think that Lagos I, so I went to an event um, last week Friday Artex Lagos and I ran into everybody I know and I learned that everybody I know knows everybody I know <laughs> that was basically my conclusion right so so Lagos feels small if you're in the network um, for the founders that we're working with these are people who have tremendous potential and have grown a lot in the past few years that we've trained them, built their skills, and now put them through the Ventures program, uh, but they never had access to those networks. Um, so, and they wouldn't even know where to start um, having access to those networks. So I think that there's also something around um, just those, those networks and those spaces. So I'm really excited to hear um, about some, some of what you're doing, for example. I, I think. Um, I mean, for us, we were able to start Semicolon partly because my co-founder and, and husband is um, a trained software engineer, you know, has the right background, I have the business management background, but because we were already in those spaces, right? Um, so I think we need to um, really create that access and, and some, you know, I think some of, so that's part of what we do with Semicolon Ventures, I think that um, through some of other deliberate programming, such as what it sounds like you're doing, um, we can start to open up those spaces more as well and, and drive more collaboration. Within the country, I think the narrative is, is really exciting. Um, and, and like on the continent, it's so exciting, right? Like you have, you have founders here who are treated like rock stars in some senses. Um, everyone will point or like clap in a founder who walks in um, or like celebrate that person. Um, I, I spent a bit of time in Kenya and I was with Tesh, who's like the founder of Market Force, um, someone we've collaborated with a bit, and he's kind of like a hometown hero. Everyone, whenever they see him, will come say hey. Um, everyone knows him, and same here. Like I think founders are really rock stars now, which is awesome. Um, and I think we, like that's a great thing. That's a really, really good thing for, for like driving the ecosystem forward. I think what I'd love to see more of and what we need to do a bit more work in is like how do you tell a global audience um, or the rest of the world about what's happening here? Um, I think that's a little bit outside of like the tech cabals or the tech points of the world that are telling the stories within the country, but like really dumbing it down and making it very simple so anyone anywhere can understand. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do at Proximity Ventures, like teaming up with great founders, great VCs. Uh, great individuals to tell their stories in ways that are super easy to comprehend. It takes a while for the business to you know, grow traction. And sometimes it, that traction just never happens. And then a co-founder decides, I'm out, just signs off. But because there was no paperwork, they are signing out um, the way our own laws work. Once those shares have been allotted to you, and your name is the register of members, you own it clean and clear. And so it's a struggle to then get them to either sell down, to honor whatever gentleman agreement you had in the beginning, or to even have them um, gift back some of the shares to the company. Now, because of the way that was structured, and there's a particular one I'm working on now, and the other co-founders have worked away, it is not attractive to any investor. And then the only single founder who's remaining doesn't also want to give out so much in the sense it will end up to him, he will think, I'm working for these people. So that company is some, somewhere in between and what we've been trying to do for the past year or so is try and see what can we give your co-founders or how can we dilute your co-founders. Now, in all of this time, people have come interested, they look at the share cap, 
they walk away. So that's one problem. The second problem I'm saying is you start the business and you've got someone who already had the business but wanted to collaborate. But then what I find is that because they already have their own business, they're not putting as much time as they should in this business. And so the weight of the business then is left to a few other people. But because they are also a valuable resource, you do not want them to go. But resentment is growing very, it's very slow, but it's growing and it's creeping. And I can see down the line there's going to be a blowout unless we resolve this issue. Um, and what I say to those kind of arrangements is look, define very clearly what they're doing and just keep it at that. Don't bother trying to get them to do more. They're not interested in doing more. If you give them that work, they will do it grudgingly and not so well. You will pick up the club many times. Um, and, and so paperwork is important, but quite apart from paperwork, just also listen to your God instincts and also play to their strengths. If what you got your partner in for was a particular resource of strength, there isn't any, you have no business getting resentful that you're the one doing the most of the work. You got them for this particular resource, stick to that and just keep the harmony. And as the business grows, hire people who have the skill sets to take care of that. Another issue I see is that the businesses are starting and they're not complying with the law. One, they may not know what the law is. <laughs> or two, they know what the law is and they're just not able to comply. Yes, it's great to collaborate, but one important thing is to see partnerships and collaborations as long-term relationships. It's like getting into bed or get, getting married to somebody, right? So be it co-founder relationships, be it you know, business relationships or strategy relationships to help you distribute your products or service. Go into relationships with people that have the same values that you have, that believe in the same things that you have, or would, would go the extra mile like you will go. If not, those people will come back and hurt you because they don't have your values. If you, if you know that you are not, that person is not able to replicate your same energy, please beware of relationships like that because they come back to bite you in the butt. So you have to be very, very careful with whom you collaborate with. Go into relationships with people that you know you can, that will basically hold your hand when things go bad. I think that enough money is coming to the continent. More money is going to come into the continent as the economic downturn continues happening because people are looking for where they can get multiples on their businesses or on their money so fast, right? However, it's not reaching the right people. A case study recently that I did was for South Africa. The amount of money in South Africa is huge. Accelerators, incubators, but guess what? It's not reaching women. It's not reaching people of color. So you can have all the resources in the world if you are not actively looking for the founders that need these resources, if you are not looking for female entrepreneurs, if you are not looking for that founder that is building in Ogun State, very far away from Lagos, if we are all acting based on FOMO, and X person is on the cap table, so I'm going to invest, we are never going to, we are going to miss out on great businesses. You cannot entrepreneur your way out of bad policies. Um, we saw that play out in Lagos when Lagos they, you know, banned all, almost all the logistic services or bikes in Lagos and millions of dollars down the drain for a business model that made sense and was solving a critical problem. And till today we have those problems. So yes, you can't entrepreneur your way out of bad policies, no matter how well we try to circumvent it. Um, but how can we change this? Um, one of my not so favorite people would say you have to start advocating with government and you know being involved with the government and i absolutely agree with that even if he's not my not super um, favorite person i will not mention his name you have to start engaging governments whether we like it or not that local government chairman that senator you have to start getting involved in politics you can't sit down in your room and write code and expect that the world will change without you stepping out and seeing how things are happening and how you can influence that you have to speak out more if you're not talking nobody's going to hear you nobody's going to think that it affects you and, and I'm not talking about one person talk, I'm talking, talking about collectively as a community. We have to start speaking to each other. Network, build out your network. One of the things that we look out for, some people think that it is, well, it's not necessarily a nice indicator, 
But when you're doing business in a continent that is as risky as Africa, we look at who is on your board. Who are you? Who knows you exist? And how can that person influence your journey if something goes wrong? So if you're building a fintech platform and maybe on your board you don't have somebody that's a former bank MD or somebody that has done work in the fintech space or somebody that's done work with SEC or regulatory bodies, then we tell you for your next race, you have to start thinking about how to fill that board space. Because when you get into trouble, it's people within your network you run to ask for help. And it's those guys that help you out, whether you like it or not. It's not going on Twitter and lamenting. It is those guys that are closer to you, that sort of have skin in the game with you, that would come to your aid. And then finally, I think just go out and vote. For goodness sake, the tech community, the ecosystem has to start voting. You can't leave your destinies to the hand of other people. I, I've said advocate, I've said, you know, be involved in policy making, but actually go out to vote. Very, very, very important. Tech Hub for a smarter you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I believe this has been an interesting episode. You can reach out to us if there is anybody at all in your community that you think should, you, whose stories should be told. Reach out to us at Silverbread N24 or at Mercy Frank using the hashtag TechUp and talk to us about the person. And we'll be absolutely sure to bring the person here and showcase the good work that the person has been doing. My name is Mercy Frank, as I always say, from myself and my crew, Keep innovating. <laughs>